Uh, what you know about PE Fitness? Uh, a more in-depth look on Dylan Jamelli's business. Wanna... The number one channel for performance enhancement. They need more for muscle advancement. Can't learn there. it from we a book Dylan or a pamphlet. Silent. Tune in for the answers, cause your body's too precious to take any chances. All right, everybody. So I could not be more excited and happy to introduce my guest to you. I have today Dr. Tony Huge. All right, Tony Huge here. Hey, Dylan. Good to see you again. You too, man. You too. So, all right. First, this is one of those times where it's probably one you never thought you'd see. Uh, I've been getting this request. I don't know if you have or not, but I've been getting this request not quite 10 years, but I would say 2014, 2015. Like this has been something it's never stopped of people wanting to see us do this and variety of reasons, maybe why or why not. But I, I am just, I can't thank you enough for being here and doing this with me. And I have the most outmost respect for you. And, and it's just a pleasure to have you on here, man. Awesome. Thank you, Dylan. Yeah, this is fun. I'm glad we're talking and uh, connecting and sharing experiences and learning and stuff. Great stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I I ran into Tony at the Mr. Olympia. It's It's been a little over a week now. And so we kind of got to talking and I thought it would be awesome if we could share because I know we have actually we have way more in common than I would have thought. And I think yeah, after your watch wife is a Filipino, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know all about that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and and so I want to, I want to get your views on a lot of things. I want to get your views on SARMs, laws, different types of cycles. You know, your what I really want to dig into first is how you've changed over the years from like you know even five six years ago because obviously me and you are the same age i'm sure we've got uh, we're in a different world now than we were in our 30s early 30s so your perception on steroid cycles like how hard you go on them or how not hard to go on them how have your views kind of evolved from where you were before yeah in the beginning i you know early on i was with coach trevor and he was like an extreme bodybuilder and an underground chemist and and uh, we developed a circle of friends of really hardcore bodybuilders, underground and professional competitive bodybuilders. And uh, we were constantly experimenting on ourselves and each other and others. And the, har the experiments were hardcore, you know, high dosages, dangerous compounds. And in that environment, it's fun and it's worth it. And there's risks and sometimes things went wrong. But that was a fun and exciting experiment time. You know, now I'm not around so many hardcore bodybuilders. Yeah, there's some, but actually they're most of the bodybuilders I'm around are pretty conservative with what they do and they don't want to try crazy things, you know. So um, I do coach clients, but it's it's not hardcore bodybuilders anymore. Like it used to be hardcore bodybuilders. Now it's more like uh, business men who want right. to biohack and optimize health and longevity and, and yeah, build muscle, burn fat, but it always ends up kind of going towards nootropics and, <laughs> you know, mental yeah. performance and stuff. So that's very different from before, but I've always been obsessed with all elements of biohacking. It's just that I had that such an opportunity to go into the deepest part of bodybuilding. So I went all the way with it. And then, you know, once you yeah. go in, you keep going you know, or working your way up that and then end up at Oxygen Gym and, you know, all the most hardcore <clears throat> bodybuilding places in the world and meeting, you know, underground chemists everywhere. So like that, uh, I still stay connected to, but mostly now I'm talking to more people about anti-aging and it's not just because I'm getting older, but that's part <laughs> of it. But it's like, it's like my peer group. Like I'm yeah. around people interested in anti-aging. We're talking about anti-aging and mental performance all the time. We're talking less about extreme bodybuilding. The less people right. around me are interested in it. So I still do some extreme bodybuilding stuff. Once in a while, I'll do a like a blast day where I take a bunch of chemistry in one day, like good, the good old days. But but then the rest of the week, that may be one day a week, and the rest of the week is I'm more like the CEO bio biohacker style, not the bodybuilder bio. So that, that would be the biggest change. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what would you say was your typical like type of cycle? Let's say like at 35 years old. I mean, cause you, I, I understand like as we get older, it's a little bit, it, 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 well, it's a lot harder to recover, to keep the same physiques. I mean, yours is pretty fucking on point. I mean, still at 41. And so what what were your cycles like? What was a typical cycle, say, like a test trend? When, like, what was it like then? And what are you kind of more at now at this point in your life? My When I was doing those cycles before, I knew I didn't want to do big cycles all the time. I right. was taking the approach of building a foundation so that my physique would be lower maintenance later. So I was trying to build new muscle cells with things like growth hormone and IGF and insulin. I didn't go very high on the anabolics because I would mm. prioritize these other things. But I did like for before a competition, do a gram of test, a gram mm -hmm. of trend and a gram of masterone for the month before the competition. But I felt so ill and yeah. I was like, no matter what, this isn't worth it. I was in agony. It was agony all day, every day. I was so grumpy and so angry and so fatigued. And it just felt awful. But I kept pushing through because I worked with a bunch of different coaches that time. And one coach wanted me to push through and see what the results would be. And I don't think the results were very good because I didn't feel good. So I couldn't train right. as hard. I didn't want to eat as much. Yeah. So then after that, I was like, okay, no more of that stuff. Uh, I will experiment with single compounds. Like I would do Trestolone or, or mint and blast that for 30 days. And then I would switch to SARM S23 and I would blast that for 30 days, but I would do like a high dosage of each one and sure. see how my body reacts to each one. So it was, it was less cycles about like, like a traditional bodybuilding cycle to build like slowly over time. It was more like very short bursts of time, very short experiments and very extreme, but only with like one compound unless it was like a bla blasting time for all of them. Yeah. And then the, the, always the idea was to use SARMs to bridge the gap. So yes. I, eventually I thought, okay, I'm just going to be off steroids completely and never use steroids again, and then just use the SARMs to maintain. So originally, before I even did my first steroid cycle, it was, all right, I'm going to use steroids to get the physique I want. I'm going to use SARMs to maintain it because SARMs won't have the same side effects. SARMs I could run my whole rest of my life and not have you know any major side effects and steroids I right. would. But steroids are a little more powerful, so I could use that to jumpstart and then transition to SARMs was the original right. plan. And sort of that's how it's gone. It's been a slower that because I wanted to do so many experiments in the meantime. But eventually where we end up is I will eventually just be on SARMs the rest of my life, low dosages and just maintain, you know, so that's where it's transitioning to. Here's a good one for you. So <laughs> this, this is kind of a maybe a three or four part question. So sorry to throw all of this at you at once, but I think people are going to really find this intriguing. So for me, um, the first time I ever ran SARMs was 2012. And at the time there were three that you could buy. And that was it. It was MK2866, S4 and MK677. And brother, MK677 was on like three sites and it was like 250, 300 bucks a shot, like for a 30 milliliter bottle. Nobody used it. Um, and so that was all you had was those two. And then came along GW and then came along LGD4033. And then the rest is history, right? Um, the first cycle I ever ran was just MK and S4, period. And it was literally to this day, probably one of the best SARM cycles I've ever ran to this day. What was your first cycle of SARMs, if you remember? And do you remember like what year? And then do you remember what exactly drew you to them? I'll tell you what drew me to them after after you go. Um, but but yeah, if you could three part question, but you know, I, I'm intrigued to know what got you started. Yeah, I I had learned about SARMs really, really long ago from a friend who's like one of these ultra nerds who would rather spend 10 hours researching what to do for his workout than actually work out. <laughs> yeah. So I, we, we, I mean, I think a lot of our, our, our audience, you, you guys out there are these bodybuilding nerds that want to research bodybuilding, don't actually want to do it. So right. he was that one, like, Oh man, he was so funny. He's so moody. We go to the gym and he'd have he'd like, he'd do a set and he'd be like, 
oh, he's like, this exercise doesn't feel right. This is an off day. I can't work out today. So he would do one set and he'd be like, oh, I just don't feel it today. But, but, it, but, but he spent like three hours perfecting his chemistry before the workout, you know? So it was just about the chemistry. Oh, yeah. So, so that was, that was my friend. And, and uh, he was always getting, trying to get me to try the newest, craziest research chemical. And he, you know, back then it was, there was, yeah, like you said, there's very few places to get it and nobody knew what it was. And he was taking these things like when it first ever became available and tr always trying to push me to take it. And he's the first one who, he's the one who gave me my first steroid injection. And he's the one who gave me my first peptide injection long before that too. Wow. So now that I think about it, he was really pushing. I never talked about this before. I didn't, it didn't click that he was the original. I was always into biohacking and health, but I was super conservative. I had experimented right. with every mainstream supplement. And then this guy is trying to convince me to do the hardcore stuff. And who would have thought that it developed into Tony huge? Like, it's funny. That's wow, great. I'm just getting nostalgic about it. Hell yeah. Um, so, so the first thing I tried was, um, carterine when it okay. very first became available long time ago. I didn't want to try anything on the androgen receptor because I was just worried that like, where all is it going to go? What else is it going to sure. grow? Like, I'm, I haven't thought about this in a while, but that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, if it grows muscles, is it going to grow something else? Am I going to get cancer? Like the same right, questions right. you get from your audience all the time. I guess those were my concerns also. I said, I'll Good just question. wait and play it safe. I'll wait till there's more anecdotal report. I'll wait to see what happens to my friend. I'm like, okay, my friend's going to take it. Let's see if he dies. If he dies, I'll <laughs> take it. If he doesn't die, I'll consider it. So I monitored him taking this stuff for years. And finally, I decided to take carterine because I thought, okay, carterine's going to increase my endurance and fat burning right. and improve my cholesterol, but it's not going to grow anything. Sure. Uh, then, so I, I, I did carterine experiment when I was uh, re a really long time ago. And I, I, I tracked my cardio progress on the elliptical, how many yeah. calories I could burn per hour. And it, and it went, it was going up like first time I could only do 600 calories in one hour on the elliptical, then 650, then 700, then kind of plateau, 725. So I'm like, okay, plateau. And then I took the carterine and it went up to a thousand. Like, I had a, like a 25% increase in my cardio performance on cartery and my mind went, I'm like, you can't fake this. I felt it. I experienced it. I watched the number on the treadmill. I put the data in, right? This is mind blowing. If athletes knew about this or who like, this is going to change everything. Yeah, so really. It was that, you know, like, I guess you have a wake up moment that opened up your mind, seeing my cartery results blew my mind. Like if this is available, like what are all these other things doing that he's using? Cause the guy doesn't even work out, doesn't know how to, you know, like I said, he gets to the gym and gives up after the first set. So, but what if someone like me who does train right and eat right, then what if we take this chemistry? Maybe, maybe we're onto something. So I didn't, but, but I waited to take the SARMs until I said, okay, I'll do my first th steroid cycle when I'm 35. I was planning ahead because testosterone levels decline. I thought might right. as well take testosterone plus more at that time. But then I saw a friend do a bodybuilding competition and he got so shredded in two months on steroids and yeah. his muscles were so dense. And as a natural, my muscles weren't dense. They looked soft. I looked great, but they were soft. Right. Uh, by my eyes, you know, the general yeah. public would have thought I looked like a bodybuilder. But I saw his physique and I'm like, I want that muscle density. So then I said, okay, I'm going to do my steroid cycle five years earlier. Now I'm inspired. So right. I did uh, test. Then I said, okay, I want to do a competition also. So I did testosterone and turinabol. Started okay. with turinabol. And I thought, well, um, then of course the same thing, everybody thinks start with an oral steroid. It's easy and don't have to inject. And then you feel like stupid. Like, why am I, why am I doing this when I, I should be injecting, you know? So right. eventually like, okay, give me the injection. And, uh, then after that, I was like, okay, then come off that cycle. And then I just continue with SARMs. Yes. But I was yeah. growing, I was growing on SARMs. I was gaining muscle on Austin. Yeah. It's and amazing. I was like, I thought I was just going to use Osterine to maintain, but I'm actually growing muscles just as if I was on steroids. And, you know, my androgen receptors are still pretty fresh at that time. I'd only done right. one cycle. 
And the cycle was to cut me down, not really to bulk up. So mm -hmm. I was still like, my body was primed and ready for something anabolic and the Austrian just lit me up. And I was like, all right, there we go. SARMs are it. Now let's try the other SARMs. Let's see what each one does and so on. And you know, I, a lot of people, I don't think they realize because everybody tends to kind of, at least from what I've observed is towards RAD 140 or, or Carterine, but MK2866, it's probably the most versatile and it's probably the most popular or most widely sold generally over all this time period. I don't think a lot of people give it that kind of credit. And, and for me, I mean, I've always, whenever I've really hit cycles, I have to use it because I always hurt my shoulder somehow, some way. And I'm telling you, man, you know that it really does help and like alleviate that pain and a lot of that tendonitis inflammation that'll build up when you start lifting heavier, right? And mm -hmm. it it blows your mind every time because it does not let you down on mm -hmm. top of everything else that like you were saying that you get from it, you know? So I don't think a lot of people realize it. So, so it took me a long time to get comfortable with the idea of taking a research chemical like SARMs, just like a lot mm -hmm. of our listeners, all that. And your videos uh, were also inspiring me because I, I felt like scared of them, but you made me feel more comfortable with them. I so like you're can't. talking about them and I'm wow. listening. I'm like, okay, this guy sounds pretty confident about it. He knows about all the different ones. He's supervising. You were supervising a lot of other people using them. Okay. Now you're a hub for anecdotal reports. Go through. Looks like people aren't having crazy side effects. Looks like people are having great gains. All right. So yeah, I think, um, you played a really important, uh, part in not just getting people comfortable with the idea of SARMs, but the idea of research chemicals as a whole, because once you take a SARM, which you help them make feel comfortable about, then it opens up your mind to, wow, what else is there? Maybe the mainstream medical community has been lying to me. What are all the golden nuggets and secrets are? And then they want to listen to you and find out like, what's next? Like, what is, what right. else? Now we know you said Austrian works. I tried it. It works. All right, Dylan, tell me what to try next because I know it's going to work. Yeah, that was I that, that period of time. That, I, I never knew that. I, I Wow, I did not know that. I really appreciate that, man, truly. I, I did not know that, and that means a great deal to me to have somebody like you. It does. It really does. Let me ask you this before I jump ahead here. What made you pick T-Ball, and, and how did you how did you like it? I'm curious how, how you liked it compared to maybe Winstraw, Anavar, or what, what you thought of it, especially because yeah. on a first time of anything, it hits you a little bit harder. So, mm -hmm. But what, what did you think about it? So I chose T-Ball because I had been studying steroids. Like, it's different studying it versus actually doing it. But, right. I mean, I started studying, like, biochemistry for performance when I was, like, 14 years old. Uh, and, but I was, I was approaching it from the natural angle, not the steroid, but it kept crossing over to steroids. So I'd keep studying steroids and reading yeah. all the steroid books and stuff. But I, th but I always told myself I'll do that in 10, 15 years, but at least I'll have an understanding of it. Right. Um, so I chose T-Ball because I, I had done a lot of research before that. Uh, over the decade before about steroids. And I knew that T-ball was a dry compound. It wasn't going to put on water weight. Um, sure. I knew it had a low propensity for side effects other than the liver, but I decided that running it for seven weeks, which is all I, my cycle was, wasn't going to be a significant burden on my liver, you know, but switch to SARMs later anyways. And um, I wanted the performance increase because I said, okay, I'm going to train harder and I'm going to train more often. So yes. I really want the recovery and the performance from it. And, and I remember when I jumped on the T-ball, my performance did skyrocket. I, I was able to train <laughs> harder, more often. I felt like invincible. And plus I'm increasing my training frequency. So I feel like I was invincible. I was running stairs a lot for my high intensity cardio and sprinting nice. up the stairs and I could time myself and I could see how many stairs I run. And, you know, again, like a 30% improvement in my performance from running T-ball. Like I had so much power and speed. Yeah. My muscles were getting denser and um, my, I was on the ketogenic diet. So I lost a ton of fat. Like, you know, f uh, yeah, I lost a huge amount of fat and I was doing cardio two hours a day, this type of thing. It was, it was excessive. But uh, 
So I chose T-ball for, for all of those reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So essentially T-ball was your first cycle then, correct? Yeah, with a testosterone foundation, I added in on the second week after I decided sure. it was silly not to. Okay, well, that's a hell of a lot better than my first cycle. <laughs> my first Holy cycle, yours. it was a pro-hormone. Um, it was Haladrol, so just an H-Drol clone. I'm in, I, I literally... I did extremely well on it, but looking back on it, clearly we know now that was idiotic. Um, and then I followed that up with Anavar and uh, Proviron after I ran like it was like a super draw clone and I gained, I, I, I was not intending to gain that kind of size. Okay. It was too much for, for me. You probably would have loved it, but it wasn't what I was wanting, you know? So I thought shit. And so I tried to cut it down and I just felt it was the worst I've ever felt. I mean, it was like, I, I hated everybody. <laughs> like, it was bad. I, I really didn't want to get out of bed. And like you were saying, when you ran the big cycle of test and trend, when you run that much, <laughs> there's no way the gains that you make are worth it. Because when you feel that bad, you don't want to train. You don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. So what I did was, is that's when I ran the MK and the S4. And I mean, the way that it, the vascularity and because, you know, I, I train different than, than you because I try to stay so lean. I would like to have more size like you do at this point, but I, I, I do so much cardio. And so I was trying to cut that down. And I'm telling you, man, like the veins and the, the abs popping, I still have pictures from that. It was 2012 when that, and, and it was, it was, it blows me away still going back and looking at it. But you know, that was how I started. I ran a few big cycles, but then it's kind of been just like SARMs and I'm a, I'm a cardio guy. So I, I run 10 miles, five days a week. And then I do elliptical oh. and I do a lot of like burpees and things like that. I'm in that kind of, I played college basketball. So I'm a different kind of, you know, athlete, I guess, than bodybuilders so why, are. Why do you do, why do you do the cardio? Cause it feels good or for health or what? Fat loss. I'm pretty, I'm pretty addicted to it at this point. Like I oh, love to, to run. Like yes. And I have, so <clears throat> I modeled, uh, internationally like fashion model in my middle twenties when I got hurt playing basketball. So I've always, I've always been up here, like staying very lean, but I'm still like in bodybuilding, so to speak. So I don't have the same kind of mentality, like guys that you that you and I coach or deal with I have a little bit different way for me personally I've gotten big before but I don't walk around comfortable like I would love to look like you do but I wouldn't feel comfortable even though I know I'd look good you know what I mean like you probably wouldn't want to look like I do because it's probably too small you know you, so, you know this this huge bodybuilder in the gym in Bangkok Aaron he's like 280 pounds now just massive exploding with muscles and I look at him and I think, God, he looks so uncomfortable. It would be so, un and I asked him and he's like, no, it feels, feels good, normal for him. Like his frame supports it. So yeah, everybody can handle a different amount of muscle. And it's a crazy feeling. Like when you put on too much muscle, I know what you mean. Cause I did that with one of the blasts I did, I gained too much. And I was like, I couldn't sleep right. Cause my arm was just too heavy. And I feel like yeah. I couldn't move cause I'm so slow. I just felt like a sloth and, and yet Aaron, 280 pounds is like jumping around perfectly comfortable, high, heavy energy says he can sleep fine with the CPAP machine. So yeah, you definitely wow. got to find like what your optimal body weight is. It's not always bigger is better. It's different. I, so how tall are you and how much do you weigh total? 220 pounds at five, 10 and a half. Okay. So I did a, I did, I did a big ass cycle of, it was test, Anadrol, Trend and Primo. And then I did GW and S4 because S4 is my favorite SARM, which I'll, we'll talk about our favorites. Um, but I went from about 178 to about 208, 209. And I mean, still about seven and a half, eight percent body fat. And I held that for like a year and a half, but I got to the point where I was like, okay, I, I just, I'm not there anymore. Like comfort level. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was for me, it was really too big, I guess, but it looked good looking back on pictures, but I couldn't mentally stay there. I couldn't do it, man. I can't eat that much and I don't feel right, I guess. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's and, everybody. And, and, 
And your wife is small already. She already makes you feel big. Like if you get bigger, you're just gonna crush her. <laughs> I know, man. She's she's literally a hundred pounds. So, but you know, I mean, you're around them. So, yeah. what what is your favorite favorite SARM of of all that you've ran, or that maybe is your go to right now? Well, um, I'll I'll pick an I'll pick an anabolic SARM after, but. MK677 because of just, I mean, what a miracle that is to be able to take a pill and have your growth hormone be as high as if you took pharmaceutical growth hormone. It's mind blowing. It's insane that every person on earth who has any remote amount of quality of life doesn't know about it. I know. It's insane how many people are injecting themselves with growth hormone who could just be taking a pill instead. Mind blowing that it's not more popular, but that's because censorship, not exactly like if you say it, it gets deleted, but just suppression of this information. It's hard to, hard to get it out in the mainstream. Uh, but if it's an anabolic arm, I, I, I looked, I looked amazing on S 23. Really? I looked like I was on trend. I wow. looked, no one would, you wouldn't believe I was taking, but I did, I did a high dose. I went up, 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 up. I went, you know, 20, then 30, then 40, 50, 60, 70. I think I might've gotten up to 80. Maybe even oh, I did like a couple days of a hundred milligrams. Wow. Yeah. And I looked like a pro bodybuilder on just, <laughs> just S23. Uh, and also because it's crushing your natural testosterone, which then crushes your estrogen, which made me like super dry. And right. I would have benefited from adding some estrogen and being a little more fuller, but I looked like a competition bodybuilder, like shredded, hard, dense. Uh, but, but the problem is that that suppresses your natural oh, you testosterone, and your fertility. There. And I knew that and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do one shot of it. It's not, it's going to be like, it's going to be like a, as suppressive as trend. Um, uh, but not to kid myself, like I'm taking such a high dosage. I might as well just be taking trend for the purpose of how much, much it's shutting me down probably. But anyways, that it just stands out as the most extreme experiment that I did with it. And then uh, I did an LGD cycle that put on a lot of size that was surprising. Um, but I didn't feel good on the higher dosage. Uh, was that, was that 40, 40, 33 that you did of LGD or 33? Yeah. Yeah. 40, 33. Okay. And, and then, uh, if I like the one I use most commonly right now is I rotate between rad 140 and AC 262. And I do that okay. because I just find like really low side effects from these ones and also prioritizing my prostate. John Bravo just did a, a video that he might have prostate cancer. Oh, and so I just filmed a reaction video <coughs> because I, and I actually wrote down like all my, all these, these, uh, of my previous lab work and my prostate values on different dates and trying to analyze what, what happened to my prostate and, and how I fixed it. And then like saying what I would do if I was John Bravo. Um, so like, like prostate was a concern for me more recently. And so I, I, I said, okay, I better use less steroids and I better use more rad 140 and AC 262 and kind of always be on one or the other, because I notice that the, the PSA will decrease and prostate symptoms will decrease when you're using these things, which is what they're made for, but no, yes. but don't talk about it, but I, they actually work for that. I'm actually using them to, you know, protect my prostate. That's awesome. So, See, a lot of people just, they, they don't know, like some of the things that we're talking about is like night and day to us, like what you said about the cholesterol with, with GW and there's several with the prostate. Um, S4 is another one for prostate. And I, I, I think that sometimes people like have a negative connotation or something in their head without actually knowing and understanding what they were developed for and what they actually do. And some of that's mainstream media nonsense, you know, that they put out there, all of these, I'm sure you've read a million FDA articles and it's like, dude, what are you talking about here? Like, this is not even remotely close. And some of that makes me wonder if they intentionally spiked a pill and then gave it to somebody and told them to take it or whatever, which is easy, to, easily done. Um, what do you think of AC two six two? Because it's not as common. I know it's it's a little newer, but not as many people have ran it. I haven't ran it yet. I've coached people that ran it, but what was what's your opinion? Like, obviously, if you're running it a lot, it's a high opinion. So I'm curious. It seems a lot like Rad one forty, but um, a little bit less of the 
uh, mental energy and okay. some, like performance energy, but more muscle size. But All right. Pretty similar. Yeah. Did you have water retention? Because I've I've read a few people say that not a lot, and it's not supposed to do that. Did you Did you have water retention with it? I don't think I get water retention. I don't think I saw water retention on anyone else who read it uh, or ran it. And I, you know, I hear that sometimes, like that someone took Austrian to get water retention or this or that. And I'm like, I just, I'm not sure exactly how that happens or what mechanism of action they're getting water retention from. Yeah, on. I don't. I'm not sure. The only one that technically should give you water retention initially in, in from what I believe and see is MK six, seven, seven. And yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's HGH can do that. MK six, seven can do that. That's what they're known for. The fat loss comes over time. Um, and that's why I don't really run those or HGH. Cause I can't mentally handle water retention, brother. Like I cannot <laughs> do it. I, I can't. Yeah. I'm one of those guys that I see every little thing and, and I know, and I can't, I can't process it. I just can't do it. I, I have a, a thing about it and I don't know. Do so you, you, if you're a model before, I understand why models have to stay thinner. I experienced that a lot, but yeah, but it must be something even more than that. Right? Like did someone say something to you or something like make you feel like you were fat or you, or you had to feel like you got, you had to get thinner or like, was there a girl you that wanted to see you shredded or what? So when I was, uh, very young, like, you know, elementary, early middle school. I was like always really good at athlete, but I was like, I wouldn't say fat, but I was definitely overweight. And it started to get to me because it's like, I know I can't my whole life. All I ever want to do is play basketball, and play football. And I would look in the mirror and I would be like super sad and I'd be training, but I'd be eating like just shit. I mean, just horrible, you know, like all the time. And I'm, I'm in an Italian family, so my mom is like, food, 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 right? Even though my dad's an athlete, she's an athlete. And then when I hit eighth grade, I went from like 5'8 to 6 foot. And just like went from like weighing 160, 165, which is a lot for an eighth grader, down to like 135, which, you know. And then it was like, I don't ever want to look like that again, ever, oh, you know. And it's been like that for me my whole life. And then modeling, it's like they embed it into you, you know, and it's it's all I've ever been around. And then it's like, I want to look perfect. I want abs. I want this. And, you know, you start getting older now. And it's like, dude, I can't I just fuck it. I'm too old now. You know, it's too difficult. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but when I looked my best in pictures, I felt my worst, you know, mm. from. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, from depleting, from being hungry and getting angry, not enough carbs, not enough this, not enough sleep. Cause you know, if you, it, when you're not, when you're depriving yourself, you don't sleep very well. And right. you're very irritable. You get stressed a lot. You're mentally not there. And so it's just like, whatever. We're going to look good, you know, the way we train and eat. You know that. So. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just trying to change now, you know, my thought and just, let it be right. I mean, and you know, this <coughs> when we're on here in front of people all the time and like at Mr. Olympia, if you don't look the part, people are not going to really, they're not going to listen or not take you as serious, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, let me ask you this at, I've noticed at least, especially the last two or three years and you know, maybe it's the way I've trained, but do you just, some days it's a little harder to recover or it's a little bit trickier. Like you got to modify some things you're doing, you know, shit like what, that. What do you mean harder to recover? Like you, like you more sore after, or like you take, takes longer, like you're weaker the next time you go into the gym or what does it feel like? It, some days it's a little bit harder for me just to want to get up out of bed. I think, cause I've gone so hard the day before. I guess oh. I do an hour and a half of cardio, you know, five days a week. And then I lift really hard. And I've had a lot of injuries. I broke my back twice, you know, shit like that. So it's eventually oh, I feel like it started to catch up a little bit. I, I still don't miss a day, but some days it's like, shit, man. You know, like, well, when I, when I was natural, I used to train harder than I've ever seen anybody train in the gym. As soon as I started and I, when I took steroids, I continued that for my first cycle and forever on after that, I never trained as hard again. Because really? the chemistry 
did so much of the work. Like I didn't have to train as hard and kill myself in the gym because I could take a little bit of SARMs, a little bit of steroids and get better results than even killing myself in the gym. So, right. and then I thought, <clears throat> I thought I was lifting so hard and so heavy <clears throat> at age 29 and not making progress for 10 years. Like I reached my natural potential when I was 20, you know, I, cause I was training since I was 14. And then like, there wasn't that much of a change in my physique from 20 to 30 because I yeah. needed steroids, you know, the next step, only so much you can do naturally. Yeah. So, uh, now I forgot what I was going to say about when I, uh, Oh, about, about recovery and like yeah. getting older and yeah. So I haven't trained that hard since then. I don't think I could, I think I would die if I did. Um, but I, every once in a while now I turn up the intensity a little bit and like, all right, let's see what I'm made of. And I feel like I'm going to die. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm like, I don't know. This is not good. And And the reason why I was also excited about steroids is like, I'm like, all right, I don't have to kill myself in the gym anymore, which now, because I was, I was wearing, my knees were getting destroyed at age 29. My knees were wrecked from, you know, lifting so many years. Yeah. And thank goodness. My knees are a hundred percent. Now I was worried they were wrecked for life, but they did recover. But, but I kept thinking like all these people are training so much harder than they need to. If they just took a little SARM or something, yep. they'd have better progress and they wouldn't have to beat themselves up so much because, of course, work, working out and weightlifting is good and all that, but you cross a certain threshold and you're creating a lot of wear and tear on the body. And I crossed that threshold and look, Ronnie Coleman crossed that threshold, but a few yeah, gear also, but you know, it's just an example of like, he's the most extreme example of someone who just destroyed themselves by training too hard. And so I knew like for health and longevity, I needed to like decrease the intensity as I get older. But the yeah. problem is now I've become such a wimp and I feel like I'm going to pass out. <laughs> after I do a hard set that I actually it's on my to-do list. Let's say we'll make it like a new year's resolution. I need to get my training performance up, even if it means I have to lose some weight, even if it means I have to go catabolic some workouts, you know, which I could use sure. chemistry to try to prevent. Even if it means I'm going to be like super sore and in pain the next day, I need to push my body like that again, because now more than ever, like the hormetic effect of suffering and then becoming better for it, you know, I, I am realizing I need that because uh, I, I got too comfortable and like the more comfortable I get and my life gets really nice and then I get too comfortable, I get so lazy and my body starts falling apart. It's the, you know, like you have to push your body and you have to bring some pain, otherwise you're going to die. And so that's where I'm at. Like I, I need to, I need to get that intensity back, but you're right. It's harder. Now we're older. So like I have to figure out where my expectations to be. Honestly, I don't know how hard. I should go maybe within a certain range I do, but I don't know, like at a certain point, am I going too hard that I'm going to, you know, uh, cause some damage to my heart or something or give myself right. a heart attack? Uh, because that's what I worry most about is like the amount of stress that, that in extreme intense weightlifting like puts on, on my heart. So yeah, that's where I'm at now mentally. I understand. And I, that's, everything you brought up is my problem <laughs> is like, I don't know any way, but like all the way when I, when I go and it's like, I, before I go to the gym, this is what I do. I have a elliptical and a treadmill here. So it's either a 10 mile run or it's an, a 90 minute thing on the elliptical. And by the time I'm done, I'm already like 1500 calories. I haven't even gone to the gym yet. Then I go to the gym and I train an hour. And I mean, it's not fucking sit on your phone and talk to people. It's, it's hard and it's muscular endurance for me is a big thing. So it's not a lot of rest in between sets. I'm going heavy now because I'm trying to get a little more size, but then it's go get on the fucking stair climber for 20 minutes when I'm done. Then I come home. I have a sauna here, which I do about 25, 30 <coughs> minutes in. And then I shower and go downstairs. Cause I got one of those expensive massage chairs. Cause I'm so fucked up that I need like daily you know, and that's what I do, man. And it's, you know, at 41, it's, it's a lot. And then it's, it's, it's dinner time. <laughs> that, that's right. And it, by then it's like 11, 1130. So it's, it's, it's probably too much. And that's why I was telling you why it's like, I'm starting to get to that point where it's like, oh, by Friday, I'm like, shit, man, it it's, gets to you. The sauna, though, I got to tell you, that has helped me a lot having that here and just going into it every night. 
it, yeah. it'll very good for stress, anxiety, because I have a lot of that and just like sleep, you know, it's, it's very soothing, I guess. So yeah, I had, I had a sauna when I was in the U S and, and that was right, amazing man. to use. Yeah. Game changer. And then now I'm at, you know, in Thailand, I, I didn't get a sauna cause they just don't even have like, that's so crazy to them to have a sauna. It's so hot, you know, I bet. <laughs> so I bet. The saunas are not popular and common, but they all, but sauna like uh locate retail locations where you go to a public sauna and pool is common. Like having a sauna at your house is very rare and it's not very many people make them and hard to source them even, but going to a public sauna. So I go to the public sauna, but that's too time consuming to go every day. Exactly. But I, I go maybe twice a week. Nice. Yeah. Cool, man. Good. And the, cold, I, I, the cold water, you know, I, I saw that you were doing that. What do you think about that? How does that feel? And, and do you feel like it's working? This, this one I did uh, yesterday. I, th I think it was, yes, maybe, maybe yesterday or the day before that was the actual ice in a bucket. So that's as yeah. cold as it can get. That's ice water. That's oh, the first time I've done ice water before man. it's always something less than ice water. And you know, you can stay in it a while and you, it's fine. You, like you go hot, cold, hot, cold. It's still shocking to you and you still get, I think, plenty of the benefits. But the ice is the next level. So, yeah, I, I, I feel like I need it even just psychologically because I've become such a wimp. And I feel like like even with like uh, girlfriends and daughters and stuff, like I need to be a man. And right. I feel myself getting softer and, and, and even being around women a lot. Like it makes me softer, I think sometimes. So it sounds funny that like, it, I feel like it makes me more of a man to jump in cold water, but it, <laughs> it really does. Yeah. It, it helped me psychologically. And then I'm filled like more responsible and more energetic. And I feel like I ready to take on more challenging things instead of wimping out. So, yeah, I, I need to find a very efficient way to do more of that type of, that type of stuff. Absolutely. That and that stuff that's nice to be able to implement, like as we get older, and really for anybody, I think. I mean, there's so much benefit, not just physically, but like you said, psychologically. And that's why when I use the sauna, man, I get in there, that's kind of where I do my prayers and relax and just clear my head and come around. And man, when I come out there, it's it's like night and day how I feel. I can't, it's just something that people I think should maybe give the opportunity to try and and kind of see how it does for them. But speaking of um, mentalities and, and things like that, I mean, I don't know that a lot of people are very aware like you and I are, but don't you feel or see that nootropics, especially the last like two, maybe two, three years have gone from like not really to like explosion of people that are understanding and seeing what they do and how good they are. Cause I've seen you talk about them when you were talking about them. I didn't really know what the fuck they even were. Um, and that's, you're one of the reasons why I even kind of looked at them. And this was, this has been several years before they were really hot when you start talking about them. So I would figure you would be one to ask what's your thoughts on them. And why do you think they've finally gotten a lot more popular and what's your favorite one? So, uh, with nootropics, I think they should be a lot more popular than they are. I think they're, they're not, I think they're not very popular compared to what they should be. So, you know, when you say they're getting a lot more popular, I'm trying to think like what demographic the, the science nerd, the bodybuilding nerds, all of, you know, us like, we like to experiment with stuff and experiment with our biology. Of course, we're all about the nootropics, Yeah, but the mainstream, like when I talk to more mainstream people, it sounds more like they just want more energy. Yeah. And, you know, the problem is like energy and increasing mental performance are two totally different things. You can take drink coffee gives you energy, right? but the mental performance increases. Yeah. A little bit, but not a lot, nothing compared to these other compounds that aren't even stimulant based. They don't give you more energy. They just, they just improve your ability to focus your um, ability to understand more complex things thoughts and problem solving, creativity, memory, alertness, and like the lack of brain fog and all of these things. Um, so my, my interest really peaked after I had the, you know, the flu that went around the whole world and right. I had it pretty bad and I had brain fog so bad that I'm positive after 
talking to it, ex- uh, Leo Longevity extensively about it. I'm positive I suffered a huge amount of brain damage from the amount of inflammation that was in my head for two weeks. Wow. Which looking back, I could have mitigated that, but I was, I was really trying to tough it out and I was trying to avoid taking certain chemistry that I knew would work. And it's a long sure. story, but it was, it's, I should have now going back because it was such a big deal and such a caused me so much damage. I, I, I should have a checklist. Okay. If I get sick, these are the things I do. So I don't leave it up to my discretion at that time, have my protocol ready. You know, people didn't have protocols at that time, but I, I did, but I had it in my head. I didn't write it down. Uh, and I couldn't remember it. My brain was so wrecked. I couldn't remember like, what am I, what else am I supposed to be taking? W- which would have come to me instantly if I didn't have that, that brain fog uh, from the inflammation. So anyways, afterwards, then my brain really performed much worse. And as time went on, I, I said, okay, I, I think I want to get my mental performance back the same way I want to get my physical performance back. Like, I feel like I'm so weak compared to what I used to be when I was younger and most people like at middle age, they maybe they're fat and then they say, I want to do transformation. I want to get in the best shape of my life. I want to be thin. I think right. this is the most common thing. Yeah. But for me, it was like, I was super smart before and now I don't feel smart. So I want to get smart again. And maybe I could even get smarter than I ever was before. Now with the, the new technology of, in the form of nootropics that's available. Right. And same thing with my, uh, I want to get like my previous performance back and I want to do cardio again and get my previous cardio back. So it's, it's like the mental performance is one of these like midlife things like, okay, it's time to give attention to this. So maybe I'm thinking maybe that a lot of the mainstream is thinking the same thing. Maybe right. they noticed that when they were younger, they felt sharp and maybe it's not even because of, of uh, mental decline. Maybe it's just because they were in school and they were subjecting themselves to different stimuli. And so maybe they're, their days all look the same now and there's no stimulus. And so their brain is just like atrophying, you know, maybe all they need to do is read a book and do some mental exercises. Maybe they don't need nootropics, but maybe they do need nootropics. Maybe they did lose a lot of brain cells along the way. Maybe things aren't firing correctly. Maybe they got hit in the head a few times uh, or, or also like me had inflammation in the brain that caused damage and, and, and also just overall aging. So these nootropics are a miracle Because we can build new brain cells and improve our brain function. And if you improve your brain function, everything else in your life improves. Like don't start with a fat loss transformation because you start with a nootropics transformation. Your fat loss journey is going to be even that much easier. You have more self-control. You'll have more drive, more energy. And, uh, you know, the ability to make difficult tasks seem easier. You know, if your brain's working properly, and uh, so I, I think that nootropics is probably one of the most important things for most people. On the other hand, you walk around and a lot of people who are just living the non-player character lifestyle, it's like, how much would it really help to be 20% more intelligent if, they're, if they have no, they're not using it in their life whatsoever. They're not reaching or trying to perform better. So I think, I think it's only going to appeal to the people who want to reach and perform better and who want more and who set goals. And actually that's like a small percentage of society. I, you're damn right. And that's, that's, that's sad, but it's true. It is, man. Those are all really good points. I appreciate you sharing all of that information because I think that that's going to really help people, you know, in general to get a better idea of it. Cause one of the things that I see that I'm sure you see is that, it's gotten really popular with gamers. And that's why I said it got really popular is because do you know how many fucking gamers there are and they're marketing it to them and they're seeing it. And I, I like to game when I can, I I just don't have the time, but because I'm, I have a lot of friends that are, I see them, you know, seeing it and using it. And I'm the first time I ever really used a nootropic was uh, one of Derek's that he sells at gorilla mind. And I was really shocked. I was like, Holy shit. Like, this shit works. I mean, I was like really into everything I was doing. Cause normally to be honest with you, I, I, cause I don't smoke weed all day. I do at night. And that's when I do my best work. That's when I write my best. I do my best videos. I do my best studying. Um, and that's what I used it for. So the nootropics caught me off guard, you know, big time. Cause it was like, okay, I got this during the day now too. Cause I don't want to smoke pot during the day. You know, I just don't. Um, Tends to be a little not. This is the same protocol. I wake up in the morning. I take nootropics that runs me through the day. As soon as they wear off, weed. 
And it's there we go. It's, it's, then you can resensitize yourself to the weed because you're not on it all the time. So you don't have to use huge dosages. And then, um, you know, it's also nice, like, uh, it's nice switching between different parts of your brain, like during the daytime, be more analytical during the nighttime, be more creative and using all parts of your brain. But at different yes. times, it, I think that's the best, most efficient way, like you to get the most amount of variety of things done effectively. Yeah. Good choice. I agree. Age. We should compare yeah. like our nootropic protocols then. Cause Every single day when I'm in Thailand, I'm doing something slightly different so that I can see the, the nuanced differences between all these different nootropics. And I'm experimenting with a lot of them. So I get a lot of data. So yeah, we yeah. have to talk about. I'm going to have to talk to you about that um, when we're done, maybe, or, or sometime when, when we have time. So you can kind of give me a, a different protocol to go with because I'm kind of <laughs> in that kind of explorative area with them and I haven't used a ton. So I'd kind of like your input and advice um, on what to go with. Oh, about the nootropics. I just remembered my original like mission statement, my original video intro when I started YouTube. It was something about, um, I will travel the world to discover the compounds that can be used, uh, safely to pioneer human evolution instead of yeah. having to abuse Adderall and steroids, because what taught me the potential of nootropics was Adderall and what taught me the potential of muscle building was steroids. But I thought there's gotta be healthier alternatives and the Adderall is amazing, but the problem is if you're going to be on it a lot, you're going to keep taking more and more of it, desensitized to it. Plus it's a stimulant and it's also not necessarily building new brain cells, but it's certainly maximizing the brain cells that you have. So like, there's a lot of things to improve on it, but like when you take something like that, or you take something like the nootropic and you feel how effective it is, you're like, wow, I want to keep experimenting and seeing what these things are capable of. I I'm telling you, man, because you know, we know how we feel every day and the mo most mornings, obviously some days are better than others, but generally speaking, it wasn't like a slight difference for me. It was like a, holy shit. Like, mm -hmm. and, and you know, you gotta, you can't, I think people need to understand you can't just do it every single day. And it's going to do that every single day. After a while, you got to like switch off or switch them up, um, take some time off, but man, <laughs> it is, it's not, slight at least it wasn't for me and and i'm a workaholic and so i know I, my mind starts wandering like an hour and a half after i got up like i go in phases where i have to get up and go do something else or just get back into it and the fucking nootropics had me sitting here like let's go you know not <laughs> not really wanting to do anything else but work so that's awesome um so let me ask you this because this is a battle that i have fought for shit, I guess now looking back on it, 10 years, um, the SARMs versus steroid thing, right? So it's like, I've broken this down a million times. I know you've broken it down a million times. What What's your view on the SARMs versus steroids when people ask, here's, here's my argument for you, and then I want to hear what you think about this and then your view. So what I've said over and over and over is, look... <laughs> I'm not sitting up here telling you that while you're using them, that the SARMs are going to be stronger than the steroids in general, right? So if you got an Anadrol, you got a D-ball or something, I'm not telling you that even the strongest SARM is going to put that kind of size on. Here's my argument on why the SARMs ultimately will be better in the long run. couple things. One, you're going to put less strain on your body and less side effects, which means your recovery is going to be easier, which then allows you to make more gains, correct? Two, when you have that opportunity with an LGD 3303 even, that's very strong, suppressive, not nearly as suppressive as a steroid, you can recover quicker from it. You can add all of that strength and size. Your capability rate is far higher because your reco recovery time is a lot lower. And when you're dealing with more side effects, more estrogen, yo-yoing up and down, it's very hard on you internally, not just on your organs but also on your tendons ligaments joints right so that's another thing you're causing yourself more long-term damage i don't really care what you gain on cycle i really don't i care about what you end up with how you recover what your blood panel looks like and ultimately 
after you've ran a cycle and if you're not on TRT after your PCT or if you're on TRT a few weeks after, that's when I want to know what your gains were. That's to me, and, and everybody's different. For me, that's what the gains are. And I will fight tooth and nail that after a fucking SARM cycle compared to a steroid cycle, chances are you're going to retain more with the SARMs. Not always, but a lot of the time. And, you know, yeah. if people don't, I don't think they grasp what it means to make gains and gaining five pounds by the time it's all said and done is a lot. It's a lot if you're retaining lean muscle. And so I'm curious your thoughts. And if I'm fucking crazy, tell me, but I just don't see it like some people do. The way you said it just made me think of a new example of it. Um, if you take steroids for an eight week cycle and then you wait eight weeks for your PCT and then see what you end up at, we're at 16 weeks. So mm -hmm. take the steroid user 16 weeks later. That would be the point, you know, like before they would start another steroid cycle at the right yes. before. <clears throat> and then take the SARMs user eight, uh, 16 weeks. So the problem is that steroid users will, will, will say like, Oh, they got their, they're bigger at the end of their cycle, but they have to include the PCT time also, because that's, that's time that they're alive, uh, you know, experiencing the human exactly. experience that they're not growing, they're shrinking. And that's not a good feeling either. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a good point. Like that's, People aren't comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges when they just say like, when you're on steroids, you're, when you're on steroids, especially steroids that cause you to retain water, you're going to feel fuller. You're going right. to, you're going to feel like the, the, the pump all the time. And on SARMs, yeah, you do get some of that, but it's not to the same level as the steroids. So that's why, like you said, also it's very individual specific and whatever their goal is, because if someone just loves being on steroids because they love like that experience feel like being like their muscles are exploding feeling mm -hmm. then that's what they want then that then that's what steroids give them but if their idea is like just to have, to look physically the best and feel the best and be the healthiest then that's the SARMs approach and then like my approach the hybrid approach use the steroids to build the muscle but use the SARMs to maintain the muscle but don't forget yeah. the second step a lot of people do steroids and think they're going to like do steroids and just come off and they just keep doing steroids over and over again because they didn't, maybe they didn't have any side effects, but then they keep doing them and then they start getting side effects and then they throw out all the chemistry. They're like, Oh, I don't want to do anything. I'm like now you just created a negative experience for yourself and you're not even going to try SARMs. No, if I was going to do steroids, I'd just do steroids. It doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. It's totally illogical. It's purely emotional. Yep. I mean, I, I think there's a much better argument for taking SARMs than steroids. I mean, how many people want to be competitive bodybuilders? Not very many, but how no. many people are taking steroids? Tons of people. And how many of those people taking steroids could substitute it for SARMs and be healthier and have more longevity in improving their physique? Yeah, I, I think SARMs deserve a lot more attention. I think SARMs and steroids are equal because each has their own benefits and drawbacks. But with the SARMs, you have a much better risk versus side effect for, uh, versus benefit. Like you yeah. got more benefits for less side effects with the SARMs, which is what most people want. And this is what's so frustrating. Then you have people that are all natural. They won't take any, anything that, that uh, you know, is unnatural or anything remotely resembles a steroid. And that's the most ridiculous position. At least take a steroid. At least yeah. take something. Don't be natural. That's the worst decision of all. That's the stupidest thing ever to be in 2023 and be a natural. Like, I'm not going to take supplements because of what? Like some, it's like a religious thing. It's like an ego thing. It's ridiculous. Eventually, everybody's going to understand. Like, you either take supplements and you live or you don't take supplements and you get weak and you die and everybody's better than you who takes supplements. <laughs> Step number one, take a supplement. I don't care if it's a steroid or a SARM, just take something. Whether right. it's a steroid or a SARM is a much smaller issue. SARMs, I think, are smarter and more smarter people will be using them than steroids for the long term, unless you're a competitive bodybuilder. But even if you're a competitive bodybuilder, there's a place for SARMs. Still yeah. at least bridge with SARMs between cycles while you're on, you know, at least, uh, you know, a, t a strong enough test base to maintain. Yes. And my, I always argue too, for GW on cycle, bulking, cutting, whatever, because GW, what it allows you to do. So I always call it the enhancement for your enhancer, because that's the one thing that can take your enhancements that you're using and enhance them because of your output, right? 
So if you're able to build more muscular endurance, less rest or more recovery quicker, more explosion, you're going to get more out of what you're doing. You don't have to just use it for weight loss. Plus, if you're taking steroids, especially Tren, it's like you brought up with the cholesterol, the blood pressure. And then also, if you're an endurance guy like me, one, you don't you don't know what's going to kill you. For me, the scariest thing about Tren wasn't so much the side effects. It was how it could hurt my cardio. That was my main concern. Uh, Seriously. Yeah, so I wouldn't run it, not for fear of the side effects, for fear of the performance. So then I ran cartering with it. It never touched my my cardio, not once. Mm -hmm. No, I noticed I noticed more problems on cardio with an oral steroid because of the lethargy I'd get four or five weeks in than I would with Tren at, at all. Yeah. So yeah. Everybody should have a bottle of MK677 and cartarine like yep. whether you want to build muscle or not these are anti-aging health energy boosting supplements that are so healthy and with the cartarine yeah like um <clears throat> not even just for just for like in, in, you know high level cardio performance like you're doing but for just energy during the day like, yes um, during uh during the Olympia days. So I, I, I take it when I need it, but I took it on the Olympia days. Cause I'm like, I'm going to be walking around a lot. I'm probably not going to have time to eat much food. My body's going to be trying to go into ketosis. It's not going to like it. And if I take carterine, I'll be able to use fat for fuel much easier. I'll be able to have more energy. I don't need to tweak out on stimulants. So I used it as like an energy stamina, almost like a nootropic during the Olympia days, for example. Nice. I mean, there's so many applications for it. Like these two things need to reach the mainstream and be on everybody's counter. On the other hand, if they do, then the government's going to work faster to take them away from us. So there's exactly. a benefit to it not getting into the mainstream, you know, selfishly. Like we want to do business and we want to teach people about it. But then once it reaches a certain point, they take it away. Exactly. It doesn't matter. It's always going to be that way. We both know that. It's absolutely ridiculous. But I digress. Um, <laughs> So that, and that kind of brings me to, cause I've, I've obviously, and you have spent years of our lives studying, using coaching with SARMs. Um, what is your feeling or your view? Because like for me, it took me a while to warm up to peptides. I'm not going to lie. Like it took me many years to warm up to them. I, I guess my first couple experiences, I was like, eh, I don't like all the injection periods, like several times a day, doing it around when I eat, like it's fucking annoying. I'm not getting as much from SARMs, but I think I've changed a lot because I took the time to run them and, and actually, you know, give myself a chance to go through a cycle of them. And I saw, okay, they, there's some, there's some good benefit here. And the recovery with TB 500 or BPC is you, you can't deny it. You just can't. Um, and I did Melanotan too, a few times. And while I got extremely dark, it was embarrassing. I mean, it got <laughs> so dark. I was living in Maui and I did uh, Melanotan and that was so bad, brother. Like I, I was embarrassed. Seriously, very embarrassed how dark I got. It was absurd. And then I it made me very nauseous. So I said, forget it. But have you ran a lot of peptides? And what's your general view or feeling on them and stacking them with SARMs, especially or nootropics? What what's your what's your view? The the first the one of the first things I took that that friend that with the mad scientist that wanted to, you know, inject me with everything, but I was being very conservative. The first injection was melanotan. And, um, yeah, you know, for skin tan and all that, but actually the way he sold me on the idea of it was all the other benefits that nobody talks about. Like there's yeah. a lot of health benefits of melanotan. In fact, Connor, Connor Murphy recently used it because he gets these, uh, boils on his legs, um, oh, from a, like a, it's a MRSA infection, he says, which that wow. sounds a little extreme, but, uh, he's had it his whole life. And it just flares up and he was, he's always researching what can you take and experimenting with different things. And he, he decided like melanotan may be the solution. So he injected the melanotan at the same time. He also applied a topical prebiotic, which I don't think, and probiotic, which I don't think actually did anything. I think it was just yeah. melanotan, but it fixed his legs. Like he did both at the same times and it fixed his legs. No more wow. boils ever since then. So Jeez. it might've been the melanotan. Yeah. So how many other things does melanotan do besides just make us tan? But I remember when I first 
started taking it and uh you know all the time getting getting hard and yes uh, hard the, and oh it was bad yeah so i i was like oh my god this is amazing this is a game changer like i never thought i'd be able to feel like that again i thought that was done when you're 18 and then it's just downhill from there but no i get that feeling back and, yeah uh, and i'm just so thankful that like i can tap into that anytime i want with pt141 or melanotan yeah but again once you use one of these compounds like that and then you realize how magical it is and you opens up your mind to all the rest of them now i i have used some peptides that i don't feel like did anything um but for the most part most of them the effects are very noticeable i mean like igf1 lr3 oh my god that's <laughs> that builds more muscle than anything else. And, um, insulin is a peptide, of course, and HGH is that they're, they're all peptides. Um, but that's not what people think of when they think of peptides. They think of like BBC one, five, seven TB 500. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, anytime anybody I know or a client gets injured, boom, I put them on BPC one, five, seven TB 500 and they heal much faster unless it's structural. And then, uh, I have, not quite celiac, but gluten sensitivity. It's really bad. I get heartburn and super bloated and feel sick. And I can't stop eating wheat because I have an addiction for it. So sometimes I eat wheat, but then I take BPC-157 and I recover very quickly. Instead of taking three days to recover my digestive system, I'm recovered You know, within less than 24 hours. My digestive system is recovered. So you know how powerful it is and how it's working. What a miracle that is. I mean, that's like... That's like, I don't, there's not, I mean, what else is there that like you can take and doubles your recovery by taking a pill? Uh, it's a, it's a miracle. You so yeah, it. peptides are, they're absolute miracles. They're like, like angels brought them down from the heavens <laughs> and delivered because these are things that are naturally occurring in our body too. Like right. our body already has BPC 157. It's just, we're giving more of it. And, you know, we get older and the, the, the easiest way to do anti-aging is just to replace your body's own natural hormones that are declining with age. And a lot of those are peptides. So like, yep. I think everybody over the age, first of all, I think everybody age 18, if they had the resource should start their anti-aging protocol now. Yes. With, you know, a variety of different things. And then like, as soon as you notice any kind of decline instantly, you should think that there must be a solution for that. I have less energy. Boom. There's a chemical solution for that. Boom. I, I have less strength. Boom. I can't sleep, whatever. But I think a lot of people, they are so just, they just accept like these ailments and they just accept aging. They just say, Oh, I'm 50 years old now. Everything hurts. I have low energy because I'm 50, but they don't realize that, that these things are all preventable, treatable, fixable with the technology we have. And it's all really cheap. I agree. I, I am literally like the opposite of accepting <sighs> anything age related like i will not accept it man i am like the ultimate anti-ager so i totally agree you know i'm i'm getting ready to start a ipamorelin and cg cjc 1295 with bp uh c and then s4 and mk 2866 i haven't done anything in like two years literally and so i thought you know what i'll keep it light and i'll tell you why so and this was gonna this is gonna segment me into what i wanted to talk to you about next um I saw you talking to uh, Dr. Andrew at the Olympia. So he's a good friend of mine. And um, I'm going to tell you something that I just found out about myself with my heart. And then I'm curious to kind of get into yours. Cause I've been, I have spent the last two months doing nothing but studying heart and cholesterol. So I have compounded the little bit of knowledge I had, not a ton to like a fucking encyclopedia. And I'm going to tell you why. So um, I started to work with uh, Dr. Anabolic Doc and Dr. Andrew, and they were telling me to get a calcium score like I heard him telling you to do. So mm -hmm. I go to get this calcium score and they're looking at me kind of weird because, you know, I'm, I don't look like it's something that somebody like me would probably need at my age younger. So I got the score expecting a zero and it came back 120. And so mm -hmm. I fucking panic. Okay. And I started to study and learn because while that's not the end of the world, it's not good. And I'm like, dude, I eat the same thing every day at the same time. Like literally 12 servings of vegetables a day. I do. I, I eat as clean as you could eat. And I never, ever cheat four or five times a year. I don't drink anymore. I did, but I don't. 
I don't smoke, obviously, except weed. I mean, like none of the, the factors. So then I went and had deep cholesterol tests because my LDL was elevated all of a sudden, and I don't know why. It never really was. Mm. So then I dig into LDL and HDL. They're, they're markers, but they're not really the markers you need. APOB, LP little a, these things that nobody really knows about. So I go to get my LP little a score. It comes back 300. It's supposed to be zero. It's bad. Like it's really bad. So I find out it's nothing I did. It's inherited. Mm-hmm. So I may have, well, I actually, I know I was, I prevented a, a guaranteed heart attack in five years, at least judging by the markers. Only because I went and got this test. So now I'm on, I heard you talk about taking Resuvastat. And so I had to start taking that. And then I'm on a PCSK9, which is for the LP little a, which is Vasipa. And I'm sitting here. I've never had any problems. I, I do all of this working out. And like, literally, had I not Would gone. Say, so Vasipa is a PSK9 inhibitor. Also yeah, P- like Repatha, Vasipa also has it, that it, mechanism. It falls into that category yes because it and it can reduce your lp little a by up to like 25 to 35 percent and so i'm trying to get the repatha now too but it's a very difficult thing with insurance and to get approved to take it like it's very very difficult so i do resuvastatin 20 milligrams um every night before i go to bed and then the vasipa and then i have a cardio and geography coming up to see how much actual blockage is literally really there because they're so cavalier about this shit and act like it's not a big deal but that number is not good you know Mm -hmm. and so i know you had um some things i had an echocardiogram done before it was perfect like nothing you know so i would have never known and that's mm-hmm. what I wanted to talk to you about this because I saw you talking about it and I wanted to let you know what I was experiencing so you could do those tests. And I kind of wondered, because I've seen you talk about you had some so like an event or an experience. What did you have and what have you found out about it and what, what maybe caused it? <clears throat> well, it was mitral valve prolapse and regurgitation. And so looking on the echo, you could see the flap in my heart when it's supposed to close. It was bending like a lot. And every time it's bending, it the blood is going all around, outside and around. And you can see the blue and the red blood. You know, like it should be like, it should be like red blood out, blue blood in. Red okay. blood out, blue blood in. But when it's, when, when, when the flap is not closing properly, then like, your ejection fraction goes down and and every time your blood pumps, it's like pumping back into the heart, some of the blood and then out. So you have this massive inefficiency. Okay. And at the time I, I asked a lot of people for advice on this and, uh, Bart, uh, the owner of muscle factory, Jim said, you know, like all ailments are the result of some nutrient deficiency. Like your body can fix anything. If it's not, then there's a nutrient deficiency. He said that you need more natural forms of vitamin C because the vitamin C with the collagen will strengthen that flap and blah, blah, blah. Yep. So I'm like, okay, add that to my list. We're going to do that. And, oh, and then, and then, you know, around, well, the reason why I went to the hospital to get this checked was I felt like I would get, I was getting dizzy so easily and I was feeling like this pressure in my chest and it felt like I was going to have a heart attack. And it was just like pressure and pain. And I was like, oh my God, I don't think it's like an acute heart attack. I think it's like something wrong. It's like the regurgitation. I could feel it in my heart and it wasn't that bad. Like other people have much worse and they, and they are not even aware of it, but I was aware of it. I could feel it. I could feel like my heart inefficiency. I'm like, something is seriously wrong. And then, you know, I have, um, all these, I have like a lot of female friends that, uh, were living with me and, um, my baby mamas just came in. So I had baby mama one, baby mama two, I had a daughter with each of them and it was Christmas time. And, you know, we have a little Christmas tree and I've got like three girlfriends there plus (laughs) baby mama one and baby mama two and plus my daughters. And, uh, yeah, I had like some sort of anxiety heart attack. (laughs) Of course, I think it would give anybody a heart attack. I'm shocked. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So then, 
Yeah, and I try not to blame them, but I almost like I felt like I wanted to blame them making drama on almost killing me, you know? But <laughs> I get it. But my heart was weak too. Another contributing factor is that I never do cardio. You're do, you're doing cardio all the time. I'm never doing cardio. And my heart I can feel is like working too hard all the time. Like it shouldn't be because I used to be in incredible flawless shape. I used to do a a lot of cardio exercise when I was younger. Yeah. I know what it feels like to have a healthy heart. And I know my heart right now doesn't even right now, even after I fixed it, isn't healthy. But I used BPC 157. I used TB 500. I took many different forms of vitamin C. I took collagen. I got on the uh, Talmasartan and, you know, rosuvastatin and azitamide for cholesterol. That's not going to affect the, the functionality of the heart. Uh, I made sure to keep my water retention and my blood pressure down yes. because part of what contributed to this problem, probably just blowing on that valve so hard with so much pressure and water retention from these blasts that I did. I mean, cause the mass blast can be healthy, but you really got to monitor the water and, and blood pressure. And I wanted to kind of push the limits and, and, and was willing to risk my health. But you know, if I have a client, I won't push them that far. Right. I push my body pretty far. And I got to an amount of muscle size that was not healthy for my heart to have to maintain at that time because I have had actually a smaller frame than it looks like also. So yeah, so all these things combined. And then um, what happened was I did this protocol where I did everything right. And there's other parts of it too, and I, I can't remember. But I just did everything right for my heart for like 30 days. And then I went back and then I got an MRI and then I got another echo and I reviewed everything and I fixed it. Wow. So, the doctor that originally diagnosed me said I would need, I would, she would recommend that I'd not right now need it, but probably in two years, I'm going to need a valve replacement. Oh, like, wow. you, you're going to need a valve replacement. There's no way to fix this. There's no drug you can take. There's no lifestyle change you can make. Like your valve is broken. You need to replace the valve. And that freaked me out because I'm like, oh my God, open heart surgery to replace a valve. Oh, like man. that's, that's because that's like strike. That's like a strike that then you're going to just, something else could go wrong. You yeah. Know? So uh, luckily I, and you know what else might be part of it? Like the power of the mind, you know, when you set your intention to heal something, I do believe that that works. And I have stories that uh, examples of it, but maybe also the psychological part, like begging my heart to heal was part of it as well. But when I went and then I got the MRI and they said, looks great. Everything looks fine. And I went back to the same doctor and got the echo done again. And she said, uh, she said, your, your heart is uh, normal. And I said, well, it was broken before. Remember? And she goes, yeah, I know. She's like, what did you do? And I'm like, I took a bunch of supplements and I did a protocol. She says, that's not possible. This can only be done with surgery. So uh, I think that's a, an amazing like testimonial for the power of chemical biohacking. Yeah. I avoided having to do a valve surgery by taking supplements and how cheap were the supplements? Like maybe the whole protocol cost me like $300 of supplements and it saved me whatever, I don't know, 10, $20,000, you know, heart surgery or man, 40, 50,000, who knows? And you know, I, I can't tell you, I mean, cause I, after I got those results, I literally was engulfed in stress and studying yeah. and reading fucking, you know how it is. I mean, just everything and everybody's got an opinion, you know? Yeah, oh, that's, that's bullshit. What I did, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I don't want to say that I don't trust anything a doctor says, but when they immediately are like, it, it doesn't matter. Like everything, the answers a, a statin. You know, and I needed it to help control the plaque that was there, but it's like it cannot treat the LP little a, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've been studying and I've been doing these protocols of supplements and like my APOB and my my LDL, my LDL what got cut in half in a month and a half. Obviously, the the Crestor did part of that work, but you know the supplement regiment that I went on and the change in the diet because I've been a very low fat diet. Um, person and I started to add some more fats and different things into my diet and it's I think it's made a drastic change but the supplements like you were talking about I, I don't think people understand like this stuff it was put here for a reason to heal us and help us 
right? I mean, everything has a method of healing somehow and you have to find it and make it work, but it's there and they just don't want you to know. It's, it's sad. I don't want to be Mr. Conspiracy, but you and I both know they don't, they just don't want you to know because it's not going to make them any money and everything is mitigate and not fix. Here, here's a, here's an, yeah, that's really a, a part of this point that I think about a lot. Like when someone dies of a heart attack or something, I mean, my first thought is like what caused it and was it preventable? And then I think, you know what? I'm sure it was preventable because how many people have I tried to tell in the mainstream or the general public like to take these supplements and they don't listen and then they die of heart attacks. And then afterwards, you know, I feel bad like um, that I didn't push them harder or like, you know, we didn't reach them more. But uh, then you have to say to yourself, well, I guess that's like survival of the fittest kind of thing, right? They yeah. didn't want to use the supplements, so they died. And I hope, I wish more people would, would like when someone dies, say, why did they die? What could they do to prevent it and then also prevent their own death? But people don't. I mean, I, I think it's just because people don't look, they just don't look far enough ahead. You know, they think like if it's not going to kill them, like if something's going to kill them right now, they're going to give it 100% attention. Right. If it's going to kill them 10 years from now, it's like, eh, it's just, it's just not real to them really. Yeah. You know? So I think the key is you have to think ahead also. Absolutely. Like you thought ahead, you thought, you know, you thought, because you said like you'd be dead in five years. Yeah. Some people would think, some people would think five years, eh, well, that can happen in five years, but you're like, no, I want to live. Yeah. So I'm going to take the supplements. <laughs> Dude, I immediately, like, as soon as I got the thing back and realized what happened, I was digging into it. Like, what do I got to do right now? I don't want to even risk this shit. You know, like, it, it's still, I'm still scared, if I'm being honest with you. But I feel better than I did about all of it. But, you know, it's just. You know, you know what else, though? <laughs> I feel like when I, when my life sucks, then I don't care about my health that much. I care more about just trying to feel good on yeah. a daily basis right yeah but when my life is awesome and perfect i'm like okay like right now everything is perfect <laughs> i just want to maintain this and I, I could just live live forever if i could just live forever and like my daily schedule now that will be happy so like now it's like okay i want to be healthy because i want to live longer and have more of these perfect days yes but before when i was miserable you know like as a lawyer killing myself with stress and just so much stress. All I can think about is like, how can I get a moment to, to, uh, to be, to feel good uh, at that time? What do I care about my health 10 years from now? Right? Yeah. I just want to feel good right now. So I think that's the problem. I think a lot of people are, they're not enjoying their lives enough right now to want to extend it and enjoy it for a lot longer. You know, I agree. And if you don't feel like you've got a lot to live for or whatever the case, you just kind of like, well, whatever, I don't care. You know, and, and I, I feel like, and, and everybody's different. I just like, okay, I have a ton to live for here and a lot I want to do. And so I just, I just want to do whatever I got to do to fix this shit. Like right now, you know? Yeah. And so I, I think we pretty much think exactly alike on that. I, I can tell. Um, let me ask you, I, I was curious about this. I wanted to ask you what, obviously I think it, it probably changes for most people. I'm probably strange as fuck but what is your diet like and like do you do a lot of do you change it a lot do you stick with something how regimented are you is it a big deal not such a big deal like what what do you kind of go through and what do you put yourself through <clears throat> originally i in order to gain weight being an ectomorph and being so thin I had to eat huge amounts of food and i couldn't eat enough clean food so i would put the clean food in the blender and drink it like broccoli, beans, tuna, and, and I would vomit it in my mouth and swallow it. And that was that uh, hardcore. Wow. Uh, as a natural pushing my limits. Um, but then I, I, even then, like it could, like it was so full and like want to gag all the time. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go like try to get as many calories from whatever it takes. So I started eating a pound of chocolate per day. Oh, shit. And a lot of cereal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a whole Hershey's just buy a whole stack of them and just eat a whole pound every day. Force feed it. Even like when I'm, when I'm, a, when I'm a three quarters of the way done with a pound of chocolate, I'm like, I don't want to eat any more chocolate because <laughs> I need to gain weight. You know? 
So what the problem is though, that combined with my mom, Italian, right? Being a good cook and there you go. feeding me lots of food. Uh, I, I had quite a food addiction. So then, <clears throat> then it became harder to control my appetite later when it's time to like, okay, so I'm not training as hard. I went to school and work. Now I'm still eating too much and now I'm getting a little fat. So I had to go through these mini cycles of trying to lose the fat and then I'd gain it back and lose the fat and gain it back. Uh, so, so then fast forward to, as a lawyer, I didn't have time to deal with food. I just had to have it as efficient as possible. Sure. And that's all that mattered. And then back into like bodybuilding competition for my first bodybuilding competition, then it got, uh, it was a ketogenic diet. Okay. And it was just no, I, I didn't set many rules on myself, but it was no carbohydrates for seven weeks. Cause I wanted wow. to be disciplined about it. Yeah. Test my discipline. And uh, I'm glad I did that. And I think that was healthy to do at the time. And then, uh, then subsequent bodybuilding shows, you know, I, I kept, I, every time I'd try to diet, it would just make me angry. And I, I'd be so grumpy because food was my pleasure. Sure. Especially from stress, like as a lawyer too, when it was so stressful, like food was a relief from stress because I didn't use any drugs. I was even against marijuana at the time when I was, a, you know, as a practicing lawyer, I thought marijuana was evil and everybody who used it should be uh, <laughs> decapitated, you know, publicly, <laughs> publicly, uh, you know, uh, killed for, to set an example by them. That's how bad I thought drugs were. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I needed the, my food as yeah. my drug. Okay. And food is a drug. So, so then the problem is like when it's time to diet for bodybuilding competitions this is pretty hard for me. So I, I had to get really creative with the food. So I got really good at like protein pancakes and protein brownies and just trying to make as many delicious things, teach all my girlfriends to make these delicious things for me that like <laughs> bodybuilding foods. Yeah. Very creative foods. So that was good. That got me through. And that still works. Like yes. now for sure, I'll take a protein brownie. I'll, that's I, you know, actually, um, she made me a uh, protein pancakes, uh, so I can eat them in the middle of the night, something delicious. Cause they're nice. delicious. Uh, so, so, so then <clears throat> when I don't care about like, <clears throat> then I built a huge amount of muscle and because I built a lot of muscle, the muscle burns the fat. Sure. So I don't have to worry about my diet so much anymore. I can't really get fat because it, all I have to do is like fast for a day and the fat will just liquefy because the muscle will chew through it. Right. And I can just take some fat burning supplements. So fat loss is super easy for me now uh, with more muscle than it used to be when I had less muscle. Right. And and now we have I have access to so much chemistry. I can burn fat off so fast. So I'm I'm less concerned about it. But like, I'm always trying to avoid doing cardio. So like my motivation of like, stop eating the ice cream, you know, don't eat, don't get a, a second or third serving of ice cream is because like, I don't want to have to end up doing cardio. <laughs> <laughs> so many people are like that too. It's crazy, man. You know, yeah. cardio for me, it's like the one time I get to sit and watch TV or I, I like to watch, I'm a big sports guy. It's like my whole life. So it's like the time I get to watch my sports debate shows or like whatever game is on or whatever. And it's like the alone time I get during the day. And I just, I, I like literally look forward to it. Seriously. I know that's crazy, but I do. So with the diet. So I literally am one of those like regimented. I eat the same thing almost at the same time every single day. Like we, my poor wife, we don't really go out to eat at all. Um, every time we go out of town, like even at the Olympia, I have to have a place that has a kitchen so I can cook and go get everything. Like right when I get off a plane, we go right to the grocery okay. store and get, I eat about 10 to 12 servings of vegetables every single day. And then it's like very boring, man. It's like, I have a, a double serving of oats with peanut butter. Um, I have eggs or egg whites. I have like an apple every day. I do a lot of Greek yogurt and like a little bit of fruits. And I, and then I, it's like, that's it, you know, every day. And then like maybe some fish, cod, halibut, something like that, uh, tuna. I don't even barely eat meat anymore. And I'm not like a vegan or not. I just don't even have it. I just, <laughs> I'm so fucking programmed. That that's just what I do. But I do like what you do. I make, 
I'll put protein powder on my egg whites or my vegetables or peanut butter on everything. I can't live without fucking peanut butter. So I'll put peanut butter on fish, like the most craziest shit, you know, just to make it good. But luckily there's a lot of pe- pr- protein peanut butters and healthy yeah. peanut butters, fancy peanut peanut butter flavors. So you're lucky if you like peanut butter, there's a lot of selection for you in America. I, wow. I agree. And I wasn't eating any fats, but peanut butter. So I started to have like sweet potatoes now or like walnuts, um, you know, things like that into the diet. But when you said you ran keto like that, how do you feel like without, cause I can't like, I turn into like really crabby and like, drained without car i don't need a lot of carbs but when i've tried to really lower them like that it hasn't worked for me i don't know if it's because of the cardio or just the way i'm wired but how did you feel well um to contrast how i felt back then versus now like now i eat a lot of carbs before bed and because i found they always said don't eat carbs before bed because it's going to interfere with your sleep but i found that if i don't eat carbs before bed i can't sleep like really? I eat carbs to sleep. <clears throat> so now I eat like I, <clears throat> that's why I had her make protein pancakes so that I can wake up in the middle of the night and eat a bunch of protein pancakes that have protein and carbs and the, the low fat. And when I did keto, yeah, I remember I felt like wired all the time. Like I had so much energy on keto and, it, and it, it's, really? part of it's because you're running on keto ketones Yeah, and I was on carterine. Makes that a big helps. difference on keto. Yeah. Carterine plus keto. Oh my God. I can't imagine <laughs> doing a keto without carterine. So so the, the carterine is 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 I, I could one answer I could just say carterine. Okay. <clears throat> but <clears throat> but the body adapts to running off ketones for fuel. And then you actually have like this really amazing sustained energy. You don't have any crashes, ment- more mentally sharp. Um, but you know, it takes a while to transition to that. The carterine helps you transition to that very quickly. Sure. You have this downtime of your body trying to learn how to burn fat for fuel. Uh, and then I think I was so exhausted, you know, that I actually didn't sleep okay because I would do two, uh, two hours of cardio, like I said, plus weightlifting. And I was just like destroyed. And so like sleep was like, oh my God, finally I get to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, but if it wasn't for all the training, then I would have like too much anxious energy on keto potentially right because my body's looking for carbs so it's a matter of can you break that card carb addiction but the more muscle mass you have the more your muscles are hungry for carbs right like doing keto right. with a lot of muscle uh if if you if you're moving around a lot or whatever you're gonna burn some glycogen and your muscles are going to get hungry for glycogen and your blood sugars are going to drop pretty low sure and so your brain can run on ketones but like your blood sugar, when it drops, you still you still do get like this dizzy, weak feeling because your body is trying to t- tell you to have some more carbs. But but a bodybuilder doing keto could still have a little bit of fruit or a little bit of carbs or whatever because there's so many places for the carbs to go. It's still getting sure. low enough to so so you could have seen. But but now like I bought um, beans also because beans are slow digesting carbs and they're filling. And so if I eat those at night, then those will help me sleep. But yeah, yeah. The point is like when you drop the carbs off, then yeah, you can get grumpy. You can get anxious and you either tra- you can transition to it to a point or find ways to, to mitigate it and thank goodness for cartering. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's funny that you brought that up because for the past, I would say, what are we in 2023? So I've been doing this since like 20, 2009. I, I swear to you, before I go to bed, I always have oatmeal before I go to bed. And it's it's a, it's a good, clean carb, but it's still a carb. And I, I mean, I've stayed. And that's why a lot of that shit is so mythical and it's just passed on BS. But I mean, it's certainly never made me gain any weight at all. You know, I mean, or give me trouble sleeping or anything. I mean, I fucking pass out at night, you know. <laughs> And it, probably, maybe it maybe it's for people who don't work out. Maybe that's probably what it is. because everybody I know that works out tells me the same thing. They avoided carbs, and then because we thought we had to, and then they ended up adding carbs, and then they sleep better. Yeah. I mean, oh, the log the logic is your body produces growth hormone at night, and if you eat carbs, you're not going to produce as much growth hormone. But True. the thing is, your those carbs are going to be digested fast enough anyways and your body's still going to produce enough growth hormone and you can if you want more growth hormone you can take mk677 you know 
Exactly right. Exactly right. And you know, the, the one, that 677 thing, one of the things that I know you get, because I get it all the time, they don't have enough studies. They don't have enough studies. But if you thoroughly look, MK677 has studies back into the 90s. So does Ostering. They're back there mm -hmm. if you actually go and look and read them. Um, and, and, and a lot of these things, yeah, some of them just did get created. But there's a lot of back studies on a lot of these if you just take the time and go look. But you have to look. Yeah. People you know. say that all the time. I wonder, like, I think, okay, maybe they're thinking there's no double blind placebo, oh, or whatever, you know, co complicated study that take costs a million dollars to do. There's none of those. But you can extrapolate from all the studies that are done. I mean, all there's never going to be a study that is exactly on point to your situation. No. Your age, your ethnicity, your life you know, epigenetics. So you have to always extrapolate. And yeah, with things like MK677, there is plenty of data extrapolate all of the things that MK67 does and doesn't do. You exactly. Know? Yeah. And you know damn well, whoever's in charge of the control group or the study can skew the shit however they want. So that's another thing that I, I like studies. I know you do. I know we depend on them, but you can't, you got to kind of take them at face value. I like human results. I like what I see people reporting. I like to see what I've done with myself and people like you uh, that yeah. I would trust for the information. And we've both and several others have talked to and seen plenty of people do it for years and years and years. That's the kind of data that I want. You know, Leo, Leo Longevity was always trying to convince me that studies are the gospel. And because uh -huh. he would read a lot of studies and he would say, no, this like if it's published in a study, like as far as under those variables, it is fact. And I just know humanity. I know business. I know the medical community. I know people on the inside of certain things to know that medical studies are easy to tamper with. Yes. There's even, uh, even I think the Harvard study, a whole bunch of studies they discovered were totally faulty due to bribes. Yep. And, and that's one that didn't get covered up. And that was, that was a lot of studies. And so those are all, those are all like people relied on those studies for so many years. And it turned out that it was all fake. Now what's scary is number one, the government, the FDA or the WHO or the, uh, NH, uh, National Health Institute. Yes. Uh, National Institute of Health. They, these can just publish information, even if there's no scientific basis and then we have to accept it as law or fact. Right. Even if it completely contradicts what you see in your own face. So, but what finally got Leo to start believing me about medical studies being, uh, not as reliable as he thought was the whole government injection thing. Uh. Because he started getting side effects from it and he started having clients and knowing other people getting side effects from it and it didn't work. Right. But the studies showed it worked and this and that. And then afterwards, the studies came out and show, oh, it doesn't work. But right. all those preliminary studies, they were all fake. I believe and, that. And he, when he finally realized that, he, was, he started questioning medical studies a little bit more. And I was hoping to show him that it's a lot more corrupt than he even ever, that he even ever realizes, you know, like I was like, that was a starting point that was have him accept that fact and then keep going into the point where you have to question everything, you know, even if you read it in a medical study, I, we're speaking the same language, my friend. I'm not going to say too much, but I think you know where I think. I'm careful with my word choice. Yeah, I see that. I love it. I love it. I, I think you know where I'm going. I certainly know where you're going. Uh, let's just say we agree a million percent um, exactly. Um, I want to talk to you about one more thing, and, and I, I have to get you back for a part two on this, too, because I could talk to you all night, honestly. Um, the, I know kind of this history, but you Tell everybody, maybe, because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be really interested in this that maybe don't know. Um, what what ultimately made you decide to go from being a lawyer? Obviously, we're, we're hearing about the stress, and that goes without saying. But one could argue, I don't, but one could argue you got this big, successful career. Why would you go from doing all this schooling and this job that you're doing to go into this, like start with you know with supplements and and 
getting into this area and why would you switch careers? And I can tell right now it's happiness and less stress and things like that. But what else was it? Because that's a lot of schooling to be a lawyer. I yeah. It's, it's yeah. a lot of schooling and it's a lot of money. So what, yeah. what's your reasoning and what, what, why did you make that switch? So first, first of all, being a lawyer wasn't my life dream or mission. It was my father's dying wish because oh. he had a real estate empire that I was to inherit okay. and manage and grow for future generations. And that's how my family rolled back then. Got it. Uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, he wanted me to go to law school. So I said, okay, I'll go to law school. You want me to go to law school? I'll go to law school. Then I'll take over the, the real estate empire. And uh, in, while I was in law school, my uncle basically stole it. The real wow. estate empire. And I didn't, I didn't know that I had rights at the time. But then later I had a class on wills and trusts that said, hey, you're, if you're the beneficiary of a will or trust, then the, you have rights. And I learned yeah. about like how to sue as a beneficiary. I was like, oh my God. I can sue him for stealing my estate. I didn't even know I could sue him for that. You know, like how naive was I? So I sued him and, you know, four, five years of battles and millions of dollars later and, and finally got through that. But that was a lot of stress also. Sure. Um, because it, it was, it was quite an emotional war. You know, this is a, it's a family divided wow. the whole family. So it was it ruined you at the core, you know, ruins your peace at a core level. And so I, in the meantime, I'm going to law school and, and I graduate law school and I, I say, okay, well, it's either time to like go into real estate, the world of real estate, which I was groomed to be, or hang up my shingle, they call it, and, uh, and post an ad on Craigslist. A lot of my lawyer friends, they, they put up job uh, 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 applications and want to go work for another law firm. But I've always been self-employed. My parents, my grandparents, everybody in my entire family was always been self-employed, had their own businesses. Sure. So I don't know how to work for someone else. I only know how to create businesses. No, 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 no. So I just started my own law firm. Like I was the, I was the first one in my whole law school, law class to just start a law firm. That's awesome. Like on day one, I got my license and boom, I put an ad on Craigslist literally the next day. Yeah. And I uh, got my business cards and all that. So yeah, I did that. And I worked my way up to a point where I hit I, what I what I felt like was a plateau. I, I became the youngest certified bankruptcy uh, or youngest certified business reorganization specialist in California and got my hourly rate up to what could have or should have been around $450 per hour, which is, as a young <laughs> lawyer, that's pretty amazing. And I built a law firm with 23 employees and uh, three, four lawyers working for me. Wow. So I was the, the head lawyer of my own law firm. And um, I made uh, I made so much money my, that I did, what am, what am I going to do with it all? You know, like I, I yeah. bought all the toys. I bought two Ferraris and my, you know, C wow. Mercedes CLS and a Cadillac Escalade and a wakeboard boat, jet skis, motorcycles, huge house on the river with a dock. And I was living this, like crazy lifestyle, just spending so much money. And like, I was still like, I'd feel super lonely sometimes and like depressed. And then other times I'm like, like uh, just hyperactive, like manic trying to manage all, all of my work and responsibility. So I didn't really have like anywhere peace in between. It was like, it was like everything's constant energy, blah, blah, blah. Or it's like silent and I'm depressed and lonely. I guess. Yeah. Like, what am I supposed to do when it's quiet? Like I start freaking out. So I, I didn't like that feeling. So, so I went to a couple things happened. Um, baby mama, one got pregnant on purpose to try to trap me because at the time I had wow. uh, seven girlfriends or <laughs> I had different one each day, you know, and, and as a lawyer, this was okay. Cause I was like, I was pretty high status. The girls were lucky to be with me. Sure. And I, you know, I had like, I was quite, quite the eligible bachelor, and, um, and, and they figured I was busy and I was busy. So they respected my time a lot. So this rotation was working perfect, but the girls started finding out about each other and I wasn't lying to them. I was honest because long story, I decided to be super honest about relationships, so, but I also didn't rub it in their face and tell them I right. didn't want to hear. Sure. So, but one of them was, was being naive. Like I thought she knew and she didn't know. And that was baby mama one. And then she, uh, then she said, okay, it's okay. I, I can accept it, blah, 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 blah. And playing all these games. But what she was, what she did, was doing was trying to stick around long enough to get pregnant so that wow. she would trap me. 
And then basically when she got pregnant, she basically said, I own you now Fuck. because she knew how important it was for me not to have a child because I would, that would enslave me. So, um, she figured it was going to trap me and, and, and eventually it did. Right. I right. still take care of her. I'm still with her, but like I, I, she, she certainly lost my trust. Like that's the worst thing anybody could have done to me is get pregnant on purpose. And I know the thing is I knew other girls were trying to get pregnant, mm -hmm. but I could like avoid it. But she, I really trusted her not to get pregnant because she actually had an abortion before because she said, I know you're not ready. So I'm gonna have an abortion. And then I got on birth control and she said she's on birth control, but then she stopped. Okay. So anyways, the point is if I would have continued down the lawyer path, then she would have controlled my uh, entire life through that. I understand. I, yeah. And the second part was then I went on a, a sex tour through Asia and I hit all these different countries and, uh, you know, learned about this, this part of the world I never knew existed. And I was meeting girls that I had like more love and connection with on the first night than would take me years to get that in America because of the, the male female dynamic, the, the polarity, yeah, like the femininity that they had. I never saw that in America, like real feminine women. Right. And so I fell in love with that and that culture. And I said, Oh my God, I have to live in Asia eventually. Yeah. But I have this huge law office. And so I'm going to have to, so I started the process of, you know, winding it down and selling it. And, but I had to create a, I had to create a, a hobby business and also like, pretend that I went insane so that I would never be forced to be a lawyer again. Right. So I started a YouTube channel to, and, and started like right out with crazy things like DNP, just being crazy, like, like not being a lawyer and uh, doing what I love, which was actually, it was a political message. The whole purpose of starting enhanced athlete was a political message, not uh. really about the supplements, but it was because I, as a lawyer, understood the corruption about how the world works. And I was so frustrated that I can't, as a lawyer, I can't tell people about the corruption of law right. because I'll lose my license. The same way a doctor can't really tell you what you should do for your health and optimal performance, or they'll lose their license. Right. They have to teach you what the physician's desk reference tells them to teach. They have to teach you what they taught in, they're taught in law school by the pharmaceutical companies. The whole system's rigged in medicine, the same as it's rigged in law. Same as it's rigged in every industry, yeah, I was gonna it's say. the same dynamic that works. Yep. It's not no conspiracy theory. Every single industry works through these same dynamics where, you know, certain powerful people want to increase their power and take power away from others. So I wanted to use the DNP as an example to teach people that not everything you read about is true. Not everything the government wants you to be scared about, you should be scared about. And also because I knew so much about biology and chemistry, since that was my passion, um, I, I figured that because like, I could debate anybody about biology and chemistry back then. And right. I'm a lawyer and I like debating. So it's like, let me really like take a shot at the mainstream. Yeah. Let me really disrupt this thing and let me use supplements, which I could, I can debate anybody to death and uh, about to open up their mind and make them realize they're being lied to by their government yeah. and the entities that they're supposed to trust and make them question everything and open up their minds. And then also traveling to Asia, it was like, Oh my God, Americans have no idea what, like how synthetic the American culture is, how fake it is and how unnatural it is. And if they knew how much better life could be, and I don't mean better like driving a better car, but I mean a better state of mind, a better interaction with people, a better relationship with, you know, between a husband and a wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, like how much better things could be, then maybe, maybe I could make enough of a change in America to where I'd actually want to live there. Yeah. Because I certainly at the time when I discovered Asia, I'm like, oh my God, America sucks. <laughs> it's horrible, but, but it has the potential to be the greatest country on earth. And, and I grew up like very proud to be an American thinking that, you know, every other country are terrorists and, and our disaster in America was the hero of the world, you know, and, and then as I grew up and learned the truth, I learned it's the opposite of that. And I was totally wrong. 
And so also part of what I did and why I do it is because I was so wrong about some things like America being uh, number one and also about um, drugs and and other things I and even steroids like then it was like, OK, I, I want to repent for what I've done. I, I was so conservative before and I was I was I was promoting a culture and an agenda even as a lawyer that I think would end in the enslavement of humanity. And I think freedom is the most important thing. Yeah. Which is not everybody feels that way. China doesn't feel that way. North Korea doesn't feel that way. But as growing up from American, what I did get from it is like freedom is the most important thing. Even though in America it was an illusion, like the value and principle of freedom was the most important thing to me. And so then when I realized Freedom's the most important thing to me, but America isn't free. It's like, I got to tell Americans this. They don't, they don't understand what's happening. They're being enslaved. Yes. They're also being told to value freedom. This is insane hypocrisy. I should be able to show them this through educating about supplements and experiments. I should be able to show them this right in their face and then they can't deny it. So yeah, it was political. It was to prove insanity. It was to have a hobby business to lose money on so that I could justify you know moving to asia and it it wasn't like i didn't start to i didn't start for the purpose of selling supplements but i did like start inventing supplements and things like uh like slim pills for example yeah because i didn't see another um like a insulin mimetic quite like it at the time so i'm like okay this is something that's needed so i started inventing some or making some formulas that i thought were needed at the time to fill the gaps uh yeah yeah, I mean, and and there's some good formulas there. I I've designed supplements before um, and sold them to companies or helped to design them, so I know the process that goes along with it. And I know, and I've, I've looked at many of your formulas, and there's several on there that are good. I sent you the picture. I bought a few things to try. I I have used the um, the fat burner, and I and I liked it before, so I wanted to throw that in with a few things I was doing now because I like it. I never feel jittery or anything yeah. on it and it's the, but the code red fat burner before was really amazing with synephrine and yohimbine yes but now they're restricting yohimbine now they limit how much synephrine you can put and it's not as powerful as it used to be it's unfortunate so you got to take more of the pills and yeah that's that's too bad that's the result of things being but 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 of the powerful ones yeah like like slim pills blue yeah. ox and black ox testosterone boosters are really strong and then the nootropic genius 2.0 the nootropic was designed uh, largely by Leo Longevity. Okay. And heavily researched. And he was going to put his name behind it. That was going to be his baby. And he passed away before, you know, the product actually, the finished product actually arrived. It's like, it's like shortly after he passed away, I got my first bottle of Genius 2.0. I was like, oh my God, if he just, if he just had gotten that, and, you know, while he was still alive, he would have been so happy. But, but the point is like, it was besides just me designing, it was also Leo who was yeah. like a master of that, of that niche. And it, it's really, it's really good and really effective. And it's five capsules because it's a lot of herbs. Sure. In the brain, but it works really well. I'm an but yeah, when we talk about nootropics more later too, I'll tell you about like, I stack that with some other things and there's some really crazy nootropics you might might want to try. Yeah, I definitely, definitely want to do that. I was going to ask you too about the, uh, the 3AD on there. Cause I, I grabbed, I wanted to try the Turkestrone. Um, cause I, I haven't, I used it once, but just briefly enough. So I wanted to try it for about eight weeks. I'm going to do a thousand milligrams on it and kind of see how that goes with the rest of what I'm doing now. But the, the 3AD, um, I know that's more of a legal pro hormone. Now, how do you, do you feel like that is, Similar to older pro hormones, I, I know it doesn't have a lot of side effects, but what's your what's your realistic feeling on that and what it can do? So, so some of the older pro hormones, they're actually they're actually steroids that are modified just a little bit to be right. pro hormones. So, right. you know, I, I'd I'd have to separate like steroid pro hormones are in the whole other category, and those are just like taking steroids, sure benefits and side effects. Um, but then there's another class of steroids that are based on a DH, a, a DHEA backbone instead of a DHT or a testosterone backbone yeah. to the molecule. 
And the DHEA-based steroids, they're not as powerful as the testosterone DHT back steroids, but they have a lot less side effects or no side effects. Right. And the weird thing about 3AD is it's the one pro hormone that not only does it not suppress testosterone, but testosterone goes up on it. Wow. So it can actually be used during PCT. So it's, it's not going to be like, I would say Osterine is a step stronger than 3AD for muscle building, but 3AD, we haven't seen a single side effect and it increases natural testosterone levels. So it's like if a natty was going to just take the first anabolic thing, 3AD for sure. No hesitation. Absolutely. No reason not to take it. Like you don't have to, you don't have to be like, Oh, should I take it? Is there going to be side effects like SARMs? Maybe you should just think about that and consider it, even though you should probably still decide on taking the SARM 3AD. There's no reason not to take it. And then like first cycle 3AD, second style cycle SARM, 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 SARMs, and then you know, try steroids after you've tried all the different SARMs. I think that's the smart way to do it. So, so like going from like natty and then on something, stepping up to even like you're stepping up into SARMs or even synergistic with SARMs to prevent su- suppression from SARMs, then it makes a lot of sense to run it. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. I was, I was digging into that one a little bit when I saw it um, on your site and I thought, okay, my concern obviously now is just anything hitting cholesterol, right? That's like my main concern. And so I was looking into that and like, okay, no, nothing like that. So this is nice. No, that I don't think people realize that toxicity, especially over time when you use like oral steroids or like something methylated, you might get away with it for a while, but that it, it, it's not like you just take it, you recover and it doesn't hit you long term, you know? So I really want to avoid that. I've taken probably more oral steroids than anything because I love the results, but it's just, it's not good like long term at all. So that something like that is, is really a game changer, you know? So that's, I appreciate the information and you actually putting that out there. So, all right, man. Well, I, I, like I said, I could talk to you all night, but I think we're getting on two hours. So we're going to have to do a part two if you're up for it. Cause this was fun. I, right. I, I know that people are going to love this and I had a great time. So I, I want to thank you for taking the time and, um, two hours is a long time and I know you're at your parents' house, but it, it's been extremely fun for me. And I really, really appreciate the time sitting here talking with you and learning from you. It, it's nice to talk to somebody that I can learn from and share experiences with. So it's just, it's really appreciated, man. Yeah. I'm sure now we'll, now we're communicating. So we'll be firing stuff back and forth. What do you think of this? What do you think about that? This, did you see this side effect, that side effect? Yeah. So yeah, this is great. This is, this is how we learn because we have to be the researchers, you know, big pharma is not going to do the research for us on this. Yeah. They jumpstart it, but they don't even doing it for performance enhancement. So really it's up to us. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, like I said, I really appreciate it. I know that when I was younger, I was a dick to a lot of people and people in like that I felt never jealous of, but maybe threatened by. And, and, and I'm just being honest because I need to say this. Okay. And there's a lot of regrets that I have at uh, younger. And one of them was the way that I didn't speak well about you or the company perhaps. And it's a big regret to me. And you've always been nothing but kind and polite. And the more that I've gotten to know you, not only do I respect you, but I just put you like on a higher pedestal. So I just wanted to say that because I owe that to you and to other people, but this is, this is awesome. It really is. And it's just, it's really appreciated. So I wanted to say that before we sign off, man, and, and just nothing but gratitude and appreciation. Well, thank you, Dylan. I appreciate it. I appreciate talking to you and I look forward to talking to you more. Absolutely. Absolutely. So everybody, thanks for tuning in. I know you're going to enjoy this and stay tuned for plenty more to come. (laughs) Dylan Jamelli and Dr. Tony Huge signing off.